Hi, I'm Stephen Feinberg, Executive Director of the Rhode Island Film and Television Office. Our guest tonight is an Emmy Award winning filmmaker. He's just a great man and we're so happy to have Dante Bellini at our table today. It's a pleasure to be here, Steve. I'm really glad you're here. Thank so, you. So, buddy, you have started out, you were an advertising executive producing partner at the RDW Group. And what did that all entail? So, um, I actually started my, I was a film uh, minor and a communications major coming out of Rhode Island College. Okay. Uh, I was one of two at the time, back in 1843. <laughs> right. um, but um, from there, uh, I started in, uh, I was the gopher for an ad agency in Providence called Fern Hanaway. Okay. As a junior in high school, uh, a junior in college. And um, I loved it. I loved being behind the scenes. And um, so I emptied the garbage. I got the coffee. I delivered things in those days. Production assistant. No, uh, gopher. Go for, go, go for the coffee, go right. empty the, yeah. you know, the trash. Um, and I loved it. And uh, Sandy Fern, who was my boss at the time, it was a pretty big agency. Uh, this is 1980. He begged me to go to New York. He begged me to go to L.A. because he knew that I had a, an affinity for uh, TV. Mm -hmm. And um, um, I said, no, I want to stay here. And uh, so I created, he, you know, he relented. And uh, I created uh, the Department of Audiovisual Production in 1980, and we started doing industrial videos. Nobody was really doing that at the time. Yeah. So we would go to these factories and make videos about what they were doing, and you know they would use it. The salespeople would use it. What clients did you <clears throat> have at that time? At the time, uh, Taco here in Rhode Island was one of our was one of our clients. A, a lot of clients that you wouldn't even know. Right. Drive It in Rhode Island was another one. Um, and uh, I, I just loved it. I loved being behind the scenes. I loved creating something um, that hadn't been done before. And uh, I essentially had the same job my whole entire career. Really? I, I retired uh, last June um, f with an agency that I was a partner in called RDW, right. RDW Group. And um, uh, even though I had you know, management responsibilities and uh, you know, I managed clients, my first love was always creating stuff in film and video. And you you uh, created your Hooligan Films production. Hooligan Hoo Film Hooligan Produ Film Productions. productions. Now, you'll get it right you'll uh, get it right yet. Hooligan yeah. Film Productions. Now how did that name come up? Um, well I have uh, a ton of nephews and nieces that I've been calling hooligans for <laughs> their entire lives. Right. And uh, that's my homage to them. Oh wonderful. So while uh, now let me ask you 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 um, you won several uh, Emmy Awards, mm -hmm. and you created this uh, uh, series. Um, let's talk. Uh, it's a it's a public service announcement. It's the Ripple Effect series. Yep. Yep. Very powerful stuff. Yep. Um, how did that all come about? And let's talk about the Ripple Effect series that you did. Sure. Um, the 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 first iteration of the Ripple Effect was called Beyond the Crash, and. Um, was this with the, the Department of Transportation? This right? is through the Department of Transportation. So the first series focused on Rhode Island State Troopers. And in fact, we shot the RAW right here in this studio. I remember. Uh, at the time. And um, uh, we took, we took uh, six troopers and, uh, who don't talk about their feelings very much. And we uh, interviewed them exhaustively. And we were trying to understand the impact and the effect and the residual effect of the horrible things, the horrible nature of the things that they see on the road. Which we're, fo we're focusing on car crashes. We're, we're, focusing on, uh, we're focusing on fatalities as a result of drunk drivers, uh, primarily. Distracted drivers also? Not at that time. Okay. This, this is all about uh, impaired, yep. impaired drivers. Yep. And uh, the, the troopers, by and large, are a very reserved bunch. They're tough, they're disciplined, and they don't talk about their feelings, but they're human like everyone else. Right. And uh, we shot the series. Uh, David Sabatka and Eric Latek were uh, part of my creative team. The top-notch team. Top-notch. Uh, RDW was the, was the agency. And uh, we, we really delved in pretty deep, and the result was this very warm, uh, emotional 
uh, after effect that these troopers felt about the victims and about how they had to reconcile their own, uh, the distance they needed to maintain, but at the same time their concern for what had, what had happened and how it affected them even years later. Um, in fact, uh, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Kevin Barry, who is still on uh, the, the, is still a Rhode Island State Trooper, he's the number two trooper uh, right now, he recalls as a very young trooper being on Route 95, it may have been a year in, and uh, he was first upon, he was first upon uh, a, scene. A, a, a scene. And he remembers the scene almost in a surreal fashion where there were, there was a young child in the back seat and Christmas presents and the, the child was, was, didn't appear to be harmed, uh, but was. And, uh, and all he can remember is the, the Christmas presents around the child. And every time he goes by that spot, it's like an immediate flashback of, about that. So he thinks about it every day. Right. And uh, so that was sort of the nature of the series. And then that evolved into uh, the ripple effect, which was really a very deep dive into the victims of drunk driving uh, fatalities and or bad crashes. And this is all about, you're, you're doing mm -hmm. this to, to, to help prevent people from Correct. from drinking and driving because of the effect, the residual effect that's going to have not on themselves, the fatality, but on Correct. their family and others that yeah. they may not even think about. Right. We wanted, you know, we looked at a, a lot of what was going on in the rest of the country. And, uh, and I have to say, and I have to say this as aggressively as I can, uh, had it not been for the stewardship of Peter Alviti, who is at the Department of Transportation. The director. The director, who... Uh, truly understood that if we wanted a behavior change, we had to change behavior. I mean, we had to we had to be in their faces and do and do things that <clears throat> were uncomfortable. Um, and he allowed, to his credit, uh, us to stretch our creative muscle. And so, we decided that looking at victims and looking at what happened to them. <clears throat> and as a result of the crash itself. And remember, the crash affects both sides of the equation, the victims uh, and the offenders, really. Right, the, right. the effects are the same once you get out of the event itself. You're, you're ostracized on the, on the offender side. You're ostracized by friends. You lose your job. There's monetary. You may go to jail. Mm -hmm. On the victim side, it's just it's a void that's left and it's awful. And, it, and it's far-reaching, its tentacles are right. far-reaching. And so we focused on people who were left behind. So Lee Burke, who lost her son in a wrong way drunk driving crash on Route 95, his first day, his first day as a, as a uh, Jamestown police officer, oh. he was coming home from, from work. We, we talked to the decubuluses, Becky White, uh, Kathy Andriozzi, whose daughter, Tori, is turning 30, um, you know, she's been, she has been uh, um, brain damaged for 17 years, um, and she is a stalwart, you know, advocate for, for um, trying to change behavior out there. So we went deep in telling these long-form stories and then creating uh, dozens and dozens of TV commercials and social pieces. And they were very, all of them, <laughs> cinematic. Yeah. I mean, artistic. Yeah cinematic, powerful, yeah. um, and you really use the craft of, of cinema yeah. to, to, to really... Well, I, as you know, I'm a nitwit. I really relied, it, relied upon uh, Eric, <coughs> Eric and Latek. David yes. to truly bring to life the, the vision that I had in my head on this, because I certainly couldn't do it alone. Yeah. And Eric, intu as you, you know Eric... Yeah. He we had Eric here at the table. <clears throat> he intuitively understands what to do and what not to do, and what what excessive means and what just the right touch is. Right. Um, and I'll tell you, uh, there's a great little story. I really wanted to uh, do something in the morgue, and lots you know lots of people talk about the gruesome and you know and they try to use the gruesome as you know as educational. I wanted to show the morgue in a way that had never been done before, and and that was the body coming in in a uh, 
in this. I don't know if you've ever I've been, been there. Yes, we filmed <clears> in the I, medical I filmed, examiner's office. Yes, I've, I've filmed there. There's too. a long hallway before you actually get to the you, examining rooms. You come, you come to the dock. You, then from the dock, they go down the long right. hallway. Yep. So you know, we set up this shot where we see the the medical examiner's van backing up, and then we see these two sort of disaffected uh, technicians um, unload wheeling this one body down the hallway and just leaving it against a wall and walking away. And it's just this dead body in this long empty hallway. And the, the whole point of that, and there was no, there was no VO, there's no narration. It's just a Mauro Colangelo's beautiful music. And the whole point was, this is, this is what happened, this is where you, where you end up. You get discarded right? in a way. It, it, th th this is your life. This right. is this is the end. Right. Um, and it was. It's my favorite spot in the entire series. And there's like a hundred pieces of content. It's it's my very favorite spot because I think it it pulls all the right chords mm -hmm. for what this whole issue is about. Right. It's 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 a, a finale. It's a caution. It's a cautionary tale for a potential offender, and it is it is a uh, affirming. Right. for the, 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 the victim, victim side. Very powerful. Yeah. And you guys should be congratulated. Obviously, yeah. you've won multiple it's, enemies. For it's a, it, it truly is a labor. And I, I'm, I'm appreciative of your, of your kind words, but it's a labor of love. And it, there was a big team, RDW uh, and, the D, and Rowland DOT, the state police, and all the partners, but, but most especially the victims and the victim families who we have all grown uh, as a family together now we're all friends uh because it's impossible not to be yeah. with these people and not want to have them be in your life for the you, rest of you, your you life you connect you're a right. powerful connection and it, it's so many of them so many of them and you know i'm just blessed to have been part of it will there be any more uh, or or is this it do you I, think no i i think that there's going to be more and i'm certainly hoping that 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 i'll be part of that okay yeah now you retired, as you said, from the RDW group, right? Um, and you're doing. You started to branch out. You didn't. You didn't say, "I'm going on a vacation. I'm taking life." Eat. No, you keep creating. Right. You most recently, one of your clients in the past has been the award-winning documentarian Ken Burns. Friend, not a client. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. Friend. You have friends in high places. <laughs> So Ken Burns, good friend. And then you decided, hey, I'm going to do a documentary on Ken Burns? Or yeah. how did that all come about? Well, uh, um, it's actually kind of funny. Funny to me anyway. Yep. Um, so, you know, we've been friends for 12 or 13 years, um, and he is one of the warmest. How did you meet Ken Burns? Uh, I called him up one day. I just okay. called him up. I got his number, and I called him up, and I asked him if he would uh, do, this, do this thing that I had uh, thought about. I had a client... Um, um, called Sturbridge Village in. I remember <clears throat> right. Right, and uh, I said we'd like to give you the first annual Ken Burns Achievement Award. <laughs> he said I never heard of this award before. Well, I just created it, and I'd like you to be the first recipient of it. <laughs> Wonderful. And he said, Oh, okay. And uh, he thought that that was kind of ballsy and bold, and so uh, uh, we met and we immediately liked each other. I was in awe. He was in, I mean, he was patient with my fawning over him. Yeah. And um, so we became friends. And we, you know, we, we have done a lot over the course of our friendship. But from day one, I would say to him, Ken, I want to do this little film about you. I want to do a film on you. And he would say no. And then the next year, I'd say, Ken, I want to do a film on you. No. And so this went on for 10 years. I have that same feeling of a no Today is a yes tomorrow. Right. Um, so we were at his favorite restaurant is, uh, is in Walpole, New Hampshire, where he lives, and it's called Burdick's. So everyone who's watching the show who loves Ken Burns should go to Burdick's. Absolutely. To maybe bump Don't into Don't all go at the same time, though. Right, right. Um, and so we're sitting there, and I said, Ken, I'm going to bring it up. Ken, I, I want to do this film on you. And he said, yes. But I, so I said, but I really want, you know, I, I think it'll be fine. He said, I said, yes. <laughs> What? <laughs> and uh, so the film is truly about 
his sense of place. So it's called Ken Burns Here and There. Did you always know that's what you were going to? I always knew that I wanted it to be intimate, this very small, intimate kind of profile about him, but, but not really delving so much into the films, but more into his who he is as a place. person and his process by which this creative output comes. Um, so, you know, we settled on that it would, it would be that and everybody was, was happy with it. And it really is uh, very, it's very warm, it's very intimate, it's a lot of Ken. Now this guy, Ken Burns, yeah. could have gone anywhere, <clears throat> right? Mm -hmm. To have his production facility. Yeah. Why did he choose Walpole? Uh, and that's a big part of the story. That's an, that's an immediate part of the story. Um, he was living in New York City. Okay. And he wanted to make his Academy Award nominated Brooklyn Bridge. He wanted to make that. He always knew he wanted to make that. And he had to make a decision. I can live in New York City at, you know, and, and try to make this film, but this film might never get made because I can't afford to make it. It's so expensive to live right. in New York City. And so a lot, of, a lot of his friends were moving to this southern New Hampshire enclave called Walpole. And he, got, he was able to get a house up there, save so much money, be able to make the film. And turn his house into a production facility as well? Well, that came later. Okay. But the, metaphorically, you know, instead of having the film canisters on top of the refrigerator and never, never hitting the, you know, the editing board, mm -hmm. he was able to get this film done because he made the move out of New York City to do it, and he's never looked back. Wow. And so we, we spend a fair amount of time talking about that. Yep. <clears throat> what, is the, what are some of the highlights about your documentary? How long is the documentary? It's 60 minutes. 60 minutes. 60 hour, minutes. Yep. And, uh, you know, we've, we've done it over the course of about a year, you know, starts and stops. Same team uh, that you've worked with on the Ripple Effect? It's primarily Eric, uh, Eric Latek yep. and myself. Mauro uh, Colangelo. did the score. Yep. Mauro Colangelo did the score. And um, I just actually saw the final mix of it the other day. And I was literally sobbing watching it because um, it's... It's my first feature, mm -hmm. you know, documentary with, you know, when you have a subject like Ken Burns, there's so much, there's such a profound nature to everything that he says that has meaning and virtue to our lives. So it, it's not like, you know, I went out and did a thing on, you know, Acme Screw Company and it's, you know, right. and it's, it's, it's long like, ranging like, effects. Right. It, this is about a guy that is in the psyche and the sensibility of, millions and millions and millions of Americans uh, and people all over the world who has done who has done things that has profoundly changed the, the the very nature of documentary and to be given the privilege to be given the privilege of doing that film a lot of people have asked to do these kinds of things and haven't been allowed to do right, it. right. Um, but to be able to do that film and to do it my way um, was was a privilege and a blessing um, and as I've told my, my wife and others, you know, mm -hmm. I may be the only person at the end of the day that likes this film, and that'll be okay. But I think it's you know, it's. But know. this is from your heart, right? It's something you're very a subject you're very passionate about, right. obviously. Yeah. And um, I you you brought a lot of love onto the onto this project. Yeah. It's 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 in many respects a labor of a, love. It's it's a labor of love for me. But it's a love story as well, and uh, you'll when when you see it, you'll understand it. Ken has a very small circle of people that he works with and interacts with, but he loves a very large circle of people, mm -hmm. and he's as human and as approachable and as accessible as you and and, and I are, probably more so because I hate people. Right, uh, we know that. Right. right. Um, and the love between Dayton Duncan, his collaborator for 30 years, and, and Ken is, a, is this beautiful, beautiful thing. They've worked on so many projects together. And in the, in the movie, in the film, uh, Dayton talks about, you know, our projects take us everywhere. We go everywhere. But we always come back to this room. And the room is the their editing suite, and mm -hmm. that's where they battle it that's out. That's where the magic happens, and, and and that's where the love happens. Right, um, and they say a lot of, and it's true. 
you can you a lot of the creation of a movie is in the editing room That's or right. a performance or w was there anything um while making this that surprised you uh that you said wow that that just uh I didn't expect that. Did you know when you started doing this, having done a documentary myself, or and I went into a subject and matter. a pretty good one, I may add. Thank you. But when I go into the subject matter of Pell and not actually knowing, finding the spine of the story through interview, did you know what your spine was going to be, what your structure was going to be, or did it start to define itself? while you were making it? I always knew what the thread was going to be. It was, it was, going, to, it was going to be linear for, mm -hmm. the, for the most part. And it was going to be, Ken himself was going to be the connectivity of right. this. And we do it in chapters. Uh, and I, I'm blessed with being able to, to have had access to some friends of his and to uh, an Ad Atlantic, you know, the Atlantic magazine, yep. to a writer who talks about the importance of small towns in America. Uh, and he adds great legitimacy to our core, our core premise that, the, that, that small towns are a, a unique breed in America. And they are, we're losing them at a rate that is incredible. Mm -hmm. But there's something that we want to hold on to, not necessarily the physical place of the small town, but what the small town Represents. spirit means. Right. Right? Like today, we don't, we don't really have small towns anymore that, you know, is the Mayberry RFD kind. Right. But we remember that you and I are of an age that we remember that kind of communal care and concern and love. Right. And that's what Walpole kind of represented for Ken. Walpole protects him, and he protects Walpole. Um, but that is not it to say or negate conflict or preclude that he loves New York City, where right. he also is resides. There, is there conflict? There's always conflict. The, I, There's always because conflict. isn't that part yeah. of the drama of when you're doing a documentary? So there is some kind of conflict in this documentary. Nope. None. No, there, there's no conflict. The conflict is in the resolute understanding that um, you can achieve if you believe in yourself and if you believe in the power of your own dreams. Do you show any obstacles that he might have faced? Uh, yeah, the whole, the whole beginning part is about Bro the, the Brooklyn Bridge and the, the challenge of getting that film made. Conflict. So the conflict yeah. is there. Um, and it's interesting because Ken is an outward person, not an inward person. And he, everything that comes out of Ken's mouth is important. It's, it's, you may think that I'm fawning, but, you know, Eric had never met him. David had never met him. Um, and you leave there always enriched, always better. I had right? dinner with him one time, a group of us, I was invited. <laughs> Were you there maybe at Bryant University? No. Uh, many years ago? No. He was uh, about to uh, uh, show his, um, I think it was the Vietnam. Mm -hmm. uh, and I had the pleasure of having dinner with him. And yeah, it was, it was it, you're in the company of someone very special. Yeah. So we're, we're, I, I make a small cameo in the film. Okay. And we are walking from his home. Uh, which is on North Road in Walpole, all the way to Burdick's, which is about a three-mile walk. And it's about zero degrees. And we're walking his dog, Chester. And um, we're walking and we're talking. And Eric, poor Eric, is, his hands are freezing. <laughs> He's carrying the red and the, his hands are freezing. And every now and then you can see, you can see the... The condensation the, right. billowing. Um, it, it was awesome. Uh, but at one point, Ken stops and he starts to quote uh, um, Emerson. No, uh, Emily. Emily Dickinson. Dickinson, and he talks about the far theatricals of the day, right? And it was with respect to this beautiful vista of Walpole, and uh, and that uh, what a lot of people don't know when he made the Civil War, this vista looked very much like many of the vistas in the South, and. Uh, he used it. So he used the shots from his walk, 
w which he walks now, to put into the Civil War. Mm -hmm. And he uses the term to describe to me why he, the far theatricals of the day. I mean, who talks like that? Right, right, right. right. It's just, it's, it paints this mental picture of, of, of what moved him to be able to do that. Awesome. Yeah. The, I can't wait to see the film. Yeah. Um, what is coming next? What's, what's next on your agenda? Um, well, there's a lot of things in the pipeline. Yeah. Um, not many that I feel comfortable uh, sure. chatting about. Yeah. But wait, wait, What kind of projects do you want to do in the, in the near future? I'm really interested in projects that are meaningful and that, that, that uh, will forward uh, and promote a discussion of goodness and virtue, uh, right and wrong in, in, many, in many respects. Uh, one that I, I, I'd be happy to talk about is um, I, I, we started shooting, uh, uh, which, which again will be another small film, um, with Mark Patinkin. And Mark faced a cancer challenge and yeah. continues to face a cancer challenge. And, you know, there's lots of content out there about cancer uh, and the effects uh, of cancer uh, medically and biologically and, you know, what, what, you know, what happens with cancer patients. And this is going to be a little bit different. This is about Mark has written an incredible uh, series, yep. a story uh, in the journal, uh, a, a very long, a very long story. And uh, he, I believe he's going to write a book about the experience as well. But... Um, this, our little film is going to be about how the diagnosis of cancer changes you. What happens to you? How does that affect you and your relationships with people? How it changes your way of thinking? Um, it's very emotional. Like I said, we started shooting last week, um, and uh, it's going to be, I believe it's going to be highly educational in, on right. one, in one respect, but I think because cancer affects all of us, there's not one person that's not touched by cancer that will find it, I think, both illuminating and uplifting. Because at the end of the day, lots of us are, are touched by it, but we're uncomfortable around it. Right. And I think that this may be uh, an eye-opener for some people. It used to be, you wouldn't even <clears throat> mention it was the C word. You wouldn't even mention yeah. it. Times have evolved. I want to thank you so much, Dante, for yeah. sharing your time with us. Oh, my, my pleasure. Your, your um, professionalism, your talent, your exuberance. And uh, we look forward to more on Double Feature. And Steve, you're a, it's always a pleasure. You're one of the best. You're a Rhode Island treasure. No, oh, thank you.